Hello and welcome back to Investigator Insights targeting the CMET receptor as a strategy for cancer therapy. Joining me once again are Dr. Johanna Bandel and Dr. David Spiegel from the Sarah Cannon Research Institute here in Nashville, Tennessee. So David, in, in the last session we were talking about the importance of protein overexpression of the CMET receptor and, and the uh, value of immunohistochemical staining um, in identifying uh, patients whose tumors uh, were met high uh, as opposed to met low. And, and you mentioned that uh, with, in one of the trials with onartuzumab that uh, patients in, in whom their staining was high two plus or three plus definitely seem to benefit as far as progression-free survival and overall survival. But if they were met low, they actually did worse when onartuzumab was added to standard therapy. So how, how important in the future um, going forward do you think the, the role of immunohistochemical staining is going to be? Um, what is going to be the role of, of fish as far as gene amplification? And are there other potential uh, biomarkers, such as Johanna had mentioned, uh, HGF overexpression, um, that you see potentially being important in, in the personalization, uh, an overworked term, but <laughs> the personalization of, of therapy um, in non-small cell lung cancer? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's complicated right now. Um, we're, we're waiting on results of, uh, from trials. Um, as, as you point out, there are many ways to measure alterations in MET, and uh, even at our center, we're doing next generation sequencing now where we can identify muta point mutations in MET. It would be nice to think that IHC is going to be the way to do it because that's, that seems to be the cheapest and most readil readily accessible way to do it, but, but we don't really have any standards in place for, for what that will be. I mean, we have trials where it was done a certain way, but I've told you an example of onartuzumab, the way it was done in that study. But that's not the way it's being done with rilotumumab, an important drug that's being developed in gastric cancer. So what if both trials are positive uh, and yet both use different IHC methodologies to measure MET? You know, how is that going to play out with companion diagnostics and, and, and requirements by the FDA? I, I think we don't know. It'd be nice to think that IHC is going to be, be a major way of assessing MET status. I think, I think that's one to bet on. Um, uh, but I think FISH is not as important, and, and we know certainly from the onartuzumab data that that is important, that certainly the patients who have higher degrees of uh, amplification match up with patients who have the highest expression and they seem to do the best. Numbers are small, but suggest that trend that the more you have of this target, the, the better you do with a drug that inhibits that target. But I think it's fair to say we, we don't know. And, and one, one quick word about the ligand story, HGF. My, there's been some difficulty in, in figuring out how to measure that. The, the actual antibody test that helps you measure that um, can attach to free ligand and, and uh, cause the number to go up. So just the assessment of it can make the um, levels of HGF seem higher. So, so that has not been entirely worked out. Interesting. When we, we talk about the, the clinical trials and um, some trials are using progression-free survival, it's a primary endpoint. Some are using overall survival, um, safety and, and, and other factors including overall response rate are looked at. With these targeted agents where they are often more cytostatic than, than cytotoxic and tumor destructive, um, what do you think is, is the best endpoint um, to really measure this? Is it, is it measuring a biomarker or is progression-free survival a, a better endpoint? Is overall survival a realistic uh, endpoint? So, John, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on you Thanks with Thanks for this. giving that to her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, it, you know, we talked about in, in the marquee trial, um, overall survival uh, endpoint not having been met. With, but with, with patients getting so many different lines of therapy, you really wonder, is, is overall survival a realistic endpoint? It's, it's probably the easiest to measure. 
but but is it always a realistic endpoint? You know, I think it depends on the tumor that you're looking at. I mean, for something like HCC, overall survival is probably very realistic. Even gastric cancer, probably very realistic. Colon's becoming messier, breast, lung becoming messier. But what's very interesting in looking at the randomized phase two studies that have been presented so far with MET inhibitors, what I find very interesting is that the overall survival data seems to be much more pronounced in terms of benefit than the progression-free survival data for these studies. And so I'm not sure where we might not be causing some sort of intrinsic change within the tumor. Because typically when you see a benefit in progression-free survival, that same degree of benefit, if you have a benefit in overall survival, holds. But in the MET story, it seems to increase. And so why that is, I'm not sure. I don't know that anybody's sure. So, so does that make the cell eventually more responsive to whatever subsequent therapies it gets? Um, is this more play on the cytostatic potential? Are we measuring um, progression in the wrong way? Um, this is a big matter of debate right now within a lot of the targeted agents is what is disease progression um, and are we measuring it correctly with just basic resist. Um, so I think right now within the trials that are ongoing, we have to capture progression free and overall survival to see if this trend continues. Um, response rate, even though we used it with the rilatumumab data in combination with panitumumab, doesn't seem to be as much of a player within the MET story, so I don't know that I would rely on those results as much as I would some sort of survival result. Very good. Any comments, David? No, I think that's fair. It, it, gets, it gets hard to lump everything together, you know, breast and, and certainly FDA, you know, uh, requirements, so to speak, have been different, right, than uh, in breast than they have been for lung. Uh, in colon, you know, colon probably has the strongest data that uh, PFS is a good surrogate for OS, but I, I think it's different. It, it is concerning, right, when you have a drug like crizotinib or uh, erlotinib that have these dramatic response rates. Um, in fact, that's what led to crizotinib's approval. You know, you, you see a drug work like that, you think it's, you know, that's got to be a real drug uh, that, that's really hitting the target. And you're not really seeing that so far with uh, the therapies we've discussed today. Is that a reason for concern? And, and I agree with Johanna that it may not be that that's the, the best measure of these drugs' activity. And, and, and maybe OS is the only way to show that. But um, it, is, it is a little frustrating that uh, you're not seeing those waterfall plots like you see uh, with those other targeted drugs. So what, what do we know about resistance? I mean, most of these agents, you know, when they have a positive effect, <coughs> it lasts for six months, sometimes 12 months, in some situations even longer. But eventually, the tumors develop resistance. What do we know about resistance mechanisms um, against the, the CMET-targeted agents? I, I, to be frank, I think we know very little. I, I mean, I think we're still working on trying to figure out if it's a, uh, a realistic target. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I guess we know that, but is it, is it going to be a clinically, um, um, uh, do we have drugs that can be effective clinically that can uh, that suppress this target? And I think like with erlotinib and crizotinib, just to follow up on that, or, or trastuzumab, um, I think then we start to learn more about why patients become resistant. I mean, there, there are work, there, there is work going on now, and, and we know you got into this in the beginning in our first segment that uh, there's all this, this interconnectedness with other pathways. So we know that other families went signaling, we know EGFR, we know, um, we know angiogenesis may play a role too in why why this pathway may not stand alone and that there may be other escape mechanisms. Certainly we know PI3 kinase is, a, is, is well known in this regard. And it, and it may be, and, and you're getting at this, I, su I suspect, uh, that, that an anti-MET therapy may not be the, the best or only strategy here. We may have to think about combining that with other targeted therapies. Yeah, I think, I think it may turn out this is more of a co-driver than, than the primary driver. It's the co-pilot. Uh, well, let's go on and talk about uh, the, the ongoing phase three trials, and we'll, we'll move back to GI malignancies. Tell us about, about some of the phase three trials with these novel agents and where things stand, and, and maybe we can help drive accrual to those trials. <laughs> right now, there's two major phase three trials that are ongoing. The first one is in hepatocellular carcinoma, looking at 
tevantinib, plus or minus placebo, in second-line therapy. And this is taking off of that randomized phase two that we discussed in the earlier segment, where we saw that benefit in time to progression and overall survival, giving a, a MET inhibitor blocker. So that's one that's occurring currently. Um, the other one is the onartuzumab gastric study uh, that's open. And this is looking at full FOX plus or minus onartuzumab for uh, first-line metastatic gastroesophageal cancer treatment. So those are the two large randomized phase threes that are So these are HER2 non-overexpressor? So they are, these are only HER2 non-overexpressing tumors. So you do need to know that status before enrolling. Talk about a disease crying for a new therapy. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're very excited. Most of the other studies right now are randomized phase twos, and we're still, we're at the point now within GI malignancies where we're taking those randomized phase twos and we need to look at the data. So we've had some press releases, for instance, there was the um, cetuximab arenotecan plus or minus tevantinib that was press released as not meeting its primary endpoint of progression-free survival. However, we still, as with the tevantinib, non-small cell lung cancer study, we still haven't seen the data yet. Right. Did MET status play an effect? Did previous treatment play an effect? <clears throat> So we have to see some of those results before we can carry those forward. We're also waiting on the results from the accomplished um, <clears throat> full FOX bevacizumab right. plus or minus um, on our tuzumab study. So as we start to see some of these results come in, I think we'll start to get more of an idea of what's going on. There is one accruing <clears throat> randomized phase two study that I wanted to talk about uh, very briefly for hepatocellular patients. And this is a study that is looking at serafinib plus or minus um, E7050, which is a combined CMET VEGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor um, that's out there. And I know that hepatocellular trials are very difficult to accrue to. And so this is one that definitely makes a lot of sense for hepatocellular patients. So that is opening and accruing right now. Very good. So that'll be almost like combining serafinib with with uh, the CMET target. Very very interesting. Well, David, what about in in non-small cell lung cancer? We we talked earlier about the Marquis trial um, it failed to meet its primary endpoint. At least it appears that it it would. Um, but there's still probably a lot of interesting data subset analysis that hopefully will come out of that trial. What other trials are going on? So, so right now, the only major, I guess, phase three trial is the onartuzumab trial. Uh, it's the uh, it's it's the follow up to the phase two study. This is a uh, we touched on it briefly in the second segment, but this is a trial that is aimed at improving overall survival in patients with refractory non-small cell lung cancer. The met lung. In the the met lung in the second third line setting. Um, so these are patients who are randomized to onartuzumab or lotinib or lotinib alone. To get on this trial, and this is the difference from the phase two, you have to have a MET high expressing tumor. So the way this works is patients are screened and, and actually uh, we were allowed to screen patients in the first line setting. So you could have a patient on carbo -olimpta, for example, who you screen for MET status. You send that, you send, send that into a central laboratory and the turnaround tells you that your patient is, yes, eligible for the study or not. You actually get EGFR mutation, mutation results with that as well. And, and then those patients who are high uh, scored the same way as in the phase two, two to three plus and greater than 50% of the cells. The, those patients are then eligible for randomization in the second and third line setting. So there are many patients actually in screening, or we call pre-screening, who we already know are high and are waiting. In fact, just recently, we closed pre-screening because, uh, you know, the commitment to those patients needs to be honored. Uh, they're waiting to go on to those studies, to that study. For other patients who, uh, who we find out they've progressed today and they're looking at this as an option, they can still enroll in this trial. It's just that you have that little bit of wait where you have to send the tissue in, see if you're going to be a high expressor or not. It's early. We're waiting to see you know, is this really a 50% cutoff? Do you have a one in two chance of getting onto this trial um, as the phase two uh, trial suggests? And I think it'll be interesting to see what the actual prevalence is of high expression. But that trial is ongoing. Um, we expect that trial to finish enrollment um, uh, by the end of the year here and uh, then look to uh, our outcomes thereafter. Hopefully in the next two years we'll have results. Very good. What about some of the other novel um agents that, are, that also include CMET in their target array. You mentioned crizotinib, 
uh, capozantinib. I think there's another antibody called ficlituzumab yeah. that, that is out there. How, how are the whoever, how, how are those agents coming along? Well, I'll, I'll just say quickly, um, in, in lung cancer, it's, uh, it's, it's slow but, but steady development. Um, I, I think rolotubumab is a very exciting drug, and I'm wanting to see more of that in lung cancer. There are some small studies that are being looked at in, in lung cancer, but I think the gastric data is what uh, everyone's waiting on. To interrupt really quick, because yeah, yeah, that, sure. that was the third randomized phase three I forgot to mention in my last. So there is also a gastric rolotubumab uh, phase three going on. Uh, but but then <clears throat> to get to your uh, yeah your excellent point about crizotinib right a drug that was first developed Johanna knows this very well first developed as a med inhibitor later you know quickly transitioned into an ALK inhibitor uh, drug but now Pfizer is going back and looking at its role in med inhibition so those are early trials still waiting on results and then in the prostate world you know as, as you mentioned the um, recently approved uh, drug from Exalexis. Um, uh, if I'm going to say Cabozantinib. Uh, Cabozantinib. Uh, is that its uh, trade name? I can't recall. Uh, so that drug's interesting, right? <clears throat> I never remember the trade yeah. names. <laughs> that, that's interesting, right? That's a drug that uh, is, I think many refer to as a dirty drug, right? Because it inhibits a lot of things like sunitinib may, you know, may, may be responsible for more than just anti-VEGF properties, mm -hmm. right? MET is one of the targets of that drug, and the data so far um, have been early in lung cancer. So there's been there's been a small series of patients who who have who have evidence of a response to a drug like that. But that drug is not yet into any large scale lung cancer trials that I'm aware of. Uh, I'm sure those are being planned right now. No, and I, and I think right now I agree with David. You know, I'm hoping that, that um, crizotinib will start moving into the GI arena as well. A cabozantinib, not quite there. I think that um, there was some uh, attempted development of a, of a precursor compound to cabozantinib, for lack of a better term, called XL880, which was a combined VEGFR, CMET, receptor, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, where they looked in gastric cancer quite a few years ago and didn't see any signal really come through. And so that's why I don't, I'm not sure that they've gone down that pathway into GI malignancies, but hopefully this is just the start of something new. There's a lot of other malignancies that are being targeted right now as well by um, MET inhibitors of various sorts, and triple negative breast cancer is one of the, the tumor types, thyroid cancer, renal cell carcinoma. So I think the MET inhibitors are here to stay in all their various forms. Right, just a lot of interesting data hopefully will come pouring out at national meetings in the next year or two. Well, very good. This has been really interesting. I have enjoyed it. I've learned a lot, and, I'm, and I hope our viewers have also. And thank both of you for taking the time to, to come and, and provide us all this really amazing information. All right, thanks. Thank you, and thanks to all of you for watching this segment of Investigator Insights, targeting the CMET receptor as a strategy for cancer therapy. So please check all of these uh, three parts. I think you will learn a lot about this very interesting emerging target for uh, cancer treatment. Thanks again.